Well, fall is in the air. It's getting nice and chilly. Perfect morning to pour yourself a hot cup of coffee and enjoy it in your Disciple Dojo Old Testament Timeline mug. Mmm. Smell that? And it's even better when you're nice and warm in your Disciple Dojo hoodie. Just need some pumpkin spice. Seriously though, these and a number of other gifts are available in our online store. That's one of the ways that we help support this ministry and provide a little bit of funding and also some name recognition for what we're doing among the hoodie wearing, coffee sipping population out there. So if you want to support Disciple Dojo and get some cool gear, uh, we've got martial arts related stuff. We've got Bible nerd stuff like this worthy as the lamb hoodie design also available in all our t-shirts. Uh, we've even got yoga pants. Everything you could want. Go check it out. We don't have any actual sponsors, so you guys have to put up with this instead of commercial reads at the beginning of our videos. But now that that's out of the way, we are going to be reviewing the Chronological Study Bible by Thomas Nelson. So let's get into it. Chronological Study Bible is available in the NIV and the NKJV. I'm not sure if there are other translations available, but I know those two are. I think the NKJV is red and the NIV is blue. It's available in hardback, like this one, as well as leather soft. It's 1,640 pages with eight full-color maps in the back. <clears throat> Remove the dust jacket here, as usual. Now, this is a double-columned all black letter edition, but all the pages are full color. So around the tops of the pages and even the subject headings and chapter numbers are in kind of this burgundy, whereas the rest of the print is in black. It's not a red letter edition, so the words of Jesus are not in red. There are no cross references, but all of the illustrations, photographs, charts, timelines, everything are in full color. Now, the Chronological Study Bible divides all of scripture up into nine epics. And the epics are actually color-coded at the top corner of each page, so you can see which epic you're in as you're reading through the Chronological Study Bible. Now, throughout the text, there are these things called time charts, and they're marked with this hourglass illustration. And they're basically like a snapshot focus on specific events that have to do with time. And this one on page 145, this gives you Israel's annual festival. So all of the festivals in Israel's annual calendar are listed, the month that it occurs in, the date that it occurs on, and then the corresponding month in our modern Julian or Gregorian. I can't ever remember which is which. Our modern calendar, so you know when the feasts are. So those time charts are sprinkled throughout the text, and there's a list of them right here at the beginning so you can see where they are in each epic. The next special feature that you find in the Chronological Study Bible are time panels. So these are kind of like if you take the broad biblical timeline and you just zoom in on a particular event or series of events that have to do with a passage, they're presented around that passage of scripture. So for example, at the top of pages 92 and 93, you have a two page spread of the time panels and these have to do with the early date of the Exodus and the late date of the Exodus. So they lay these out side by side, and they give you the chronology of the events of Moses' life based on those two dates. So if you advocate for the early date, then that's this information here. If you hold to the later date, that's this information here. And so it lets the reader see both views and get a feel for when in time these things happened. Now, there are a few other features as well that you're gonna find throughout this Bible. There are these small charts called time capsules, and these basically give lists of dates and the things that happened in the world in those dates. So it says in 7,000, stone tools shaped by grinding from Europe. So in Europe, this is when you started finding stone tools that were shaped through the process of grinding. 6770 BC, carbon-14 dating of ashes at Jericho. 6500 BC, cattle domesticated in Turkey. So these time capsules are like time capsules. They're just little snapshots throughout the text of what was going on in the broader world at the time. So you get a feel for when in history the events that you're reading about took place. And one of the more well-known contributors, because he's written so much, is Craig Keener. 
If you know anything about New Testament studies, you know Craig Keener is the man when it comes to the world of the Bible biblical background. His bibliographies are longer than most books you'll ever read. So that was cool to see that Keener was part of this, along with a number of other really good scholars. Now, some other things that you're going to see as you read through this, there are these little tiny articles, not even articles, they're usually only a couple of sentences long, but they're like little snapshots of things having to do with culture, science, technology, art, literature, marriage and family, religious practices in the ancient world, daily life and customs, trade and economics. So all of the things that kind of help, once again, put you into the world, and they don't specifically tie to any of the texts necessarily, but they usually have to do with something that's being read in that general section, little daily life insights. And then the bread and butter of the study material in the Chronological Study Bible are these articles that are usually at the top or the bottom of each page. They give background information that helps you make sense of the text, and they're really, really good. And you can find the index of all of them at the very back after the final page of Revelation, and they're grouped according to the categories. Then after that comes a glossary, and then after the glossary comes the concordance by Kohlenberger, which is key to the NIV. And then at the end, you come to the index of scripture. This is important, and I'll go into that in just a minute. After the index of scripture, you have two reading plans for daily reading. You have a one-year reading plan and you have a two-year reading plan. And that's it. Then we come to the maps. So what is the Chronological Study Bible's most distinctive feature? Well, it's chronological. And the introduction at the beginning tells you about why they put together a chronological study Bible and what the benefits are of studying the Bible chronologically. Most readers find out very quickly into their reading of Scripture that the books of the Bible are not always in order. And that can get confusing for modern readers who are used to history being laid out along a linear timeline. So if you're reading about events in one book and then you turn the page and the next book takes place centuries before, then that can mess with people's understanding of where they are in Scripture and it can make Scripture seem like a puzzle. So what the editors of the Chronological Study Bible did was they took all of the text of Scripture and they reorganized it, sometimes moving whole books, sometimes moving parts of books into one long flowing chronological text. And it's divided up into nine epics. And at the beginning of each epic, they've put an introduction. It's usually two to three pages. And then between sections in the text, they have these little articles called transition. And they have a little arrow beside them. And these just kind of move you from one scene to the next. This kind of tell you, okay, now this is what's going on. And now this is happening. And now this is happening. So there aren't breaks from one book to the next. Books just flow right into the other. And so at the top of each page, it tells you what epic you're in, the general dates of what's taking place on this page. And, and a lot of the dates are estimates because they're not exactly precise. And then in the middle, it shows you the scripture references by Book of the Bible that are on that page. So I'm going to walk you through some of these images so you can get a feel for what you're going to find in it. We're going to look at Epic 1. So at the beginning of Epic 1, you have this introduction before the patriarchs. So creation to 2000 BC. And the text notes this is called prehistory. It happens before there was anything known as history that existed in the world. Then there's a quick overview of the archaeological ages. So the Old Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, New Stone Age, Copper Stone Age, Early Bronze Age. There's a section about the different peoples and groups, the biblical literature, when that started to be formed, and then the beginnings of human civilization. Then after that epic introduction, you come to the first transition, and that's an introduction to the book of Genesis. Most of the books in the Bible do have one of these transitions when the book begins. So you don't get book introductions in this, but you do get the books mentioned at the beginning whenever there's a transition and that book starts. So here's the book of Genesis, and it gives you a quick overview of the book of Genesis. It does talk a little bit about the different proposals for authorship of Genesis, and down at the bottom it talks about how some scholars attribute Genesis to numerous authors, others attribute it mostly to Moses, and then views in between. And it doesn't take a particular view, and that's one of the characteristics that I found 
of the Chronological Study Bible, whenever there are positions where scholars differ, the Chronological Study Bible goes out of its way to not take a position. So the dates of the Exodus, it doesn't take a position. The composition of the Pentateuch doesn't take a strong position. Whether there are one, two, or even three Isaiahs, it doesn't take a strong position. It gives you the reasons that scholars propose very briefly, not a ton of information on it. And then it allows for the reader to decide what they think is the most plausible. So when it comes to when the book of Daniel was written, because there's a lot of controversy around that, the Chronological Study Bible puts the various chapters of Daniel into the positions of the events that those chapters are supposedly describing. But it notes that there is some disagreement among scholars on where those should be placed. Same thing with the wisdom literature, number of the Psalms, the book of Job. Those books are really hard to date. And so the compilers of the Chronological Study Bible admit in the introduction that some of the dates that they chose seem somewhat arbitrary because you could genuinely put certain books or certain parts of certain books in numerous different places and they would still work. But overall, I was really pleased with how the Chronological Study Bible handles things where scholars disagree. They do what I think a good study Bible should do, which is give you the positions and allow you to determine what you think is the most plausible. So here's an example. In Genesis, when it's talking about the genealogies of Genesis, right down here at the bottom of this transition paragraph, it says, Thus, different interpreters treat the genealogies in different ways. Some add up the successive generations, as did Usher, that's Bishop James Usher, to arrive at a date for creation sometime around 4004 B.C., Others take the genealogies as schemes of ancient mathematicians with different purposes and accept that a date for the creation of the world is impossible to determine. Or on the map that shows the route of the Exodus. They say two routes have been proposed for the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. A northern route moves east from Ramses along the northern Sinai coast. The southern route passes Sukkoth, continuing to the lower region of the Sinai Peninsula. Now, in this case, they did include alternate routes, but they only included two, and that's not correct. There are more proposed routes for the exodus. And we have a whole video on this here at Disciple Dojo. If you haven't seen it already, check that out. I'll put a link in the description below. But this is a case where they did give multiple views, but they didn't give enough. Because there are more proposed routes than this, and there are more plausible routes than the ones that they've presented here on this page. So that was a little disappointing. But then here's where they did a good job when talking about how they handled the census numbers. The transition article at Numbers says the census numbers are surprisingly large, and interpreters have often been puzzled by them. For instance, how could 603,550 fighting men be intimidated by the tiny nation of Edom? To answer such questions, many have noted that the Hebrew word for thousand is the same as the word for clan. Understood that way, the numbers would be considerably lower. So they don't take a hard position, they just note that here are some problems with the traditional view of these numbers just being literal mathematical numbers. And here is one of the things that scholars have noted about those numbers, which makes a difference in how we read the text, but without pressing for one or the other. And one more example that I really was glad to see. In 1 Samuel 17, they have an article, How Big is a Giant? And if you've seen our superhero seminary video here, where Professor Ant-Man explains how tall Goliath actually was, this article presents a good overview of the information in that video. Another area that I really appreciated was in how they handled Revelation. At the beginning of where Revelation starts, the transition article and the article on apocalyptic writings and the end times right before it, they note how apocalyptic literature functions, how it is and is not to be read. They give an overview of the different ways that interpreters have approached Revelation, the futurist, preterist, historicist, and idealist readings, and then they argue that a mixture of all of them is most likely. And they also cover the different views of the millennium. They talk about amillennialism, premillennialism, postmillennialism, but without taking a specific position on any one. There was a good article on Nero's number, 666. We've talked about that here at Superhero Seminary. You can check out Professor Beastman's lecture on the mark of the beast and what that number actually meant. So overall, the content is handled very well. If you follow Disciple Dojo for the summer, you've seen our video series that we've done on the background of the Bible, specifically the 
the background of Mount Sinai and the temple tabernacle, the Levitical priesthood. So I was interested to see how those topics were handled in the Chronological Study Bible. I was not disappointed. Every single topic that we've covered in that video series, which if you've missed it, I'm going to put a link in the video description so you can see all of those videos. Every one of those topics, there was an article on in the Chronological Study Bible. There was an article right on page five, Creation by Conquest in Babylon, about temple building after creation and how the creation itself was an act of conquest. And that's how the ancients would have understood it. And then in scripture, you don't see that. You actually have a subversion of that but still using those motifs. Page 11, when the gods tire of noisy humans and the difference between how humanity is created in the other ancient Near East accounts versus humanity's creation in the garden in Genesis. Abram's ceremony and a Hittite ritual. They even mention the ritual between the rivers that we've looked at, where an army would take a goat, a puppy, and a piglet and sacrifice them in a specific ritual that would hopefully help ensure victory. I've never seen that discussed in any study Bible, honestly, at least any that I've reviewed, and it's right here on page 24. On page 269, there's an article about the different Canaanite gods and how the pantheon was organized, the four tiers of the gods of Canaan. So you have El at the top, and then you have his children below that who kind of oversee broad areas. Then underneath that, you have these artisans and these gods of specific areas. And then underneath that, you have the messengers of the gods. Really good, helpful background information that most study Bibles don't get into. On page 271, there's a whole article on Anath. Now, if you've watched some of the previous series that I mentioned here at Disciple Dojo, we've talked about Anath, how she was either Baal's wife or sister or something in between, how she was a ferocious warrior goddess. And the Chronological Study Bible article notes that she was also kind of daddy's girl. She was indulged by her father to the point of being spoiled. And you see that when you read the Baal cycle in the Ugaritic literature, you can see Anath basically just pitching temper tantrums or threatening to beat up her dad, or just not showing respect for the office that her father held as the high god over all the gods. So that was cool to see in a popular level study Bible, because you usually have to go digging around in a textbook on Ugaritic mythology in order to get that level of background information. On page 276, there's an article about Baal, the god of the storm, why the Canaanites worshipped him, what was his relationship to the land, what type of god was he. On page 362, storm god imagery. We've talked a lot about that, how some of the Psalms co-opt some of this imagery that was applied to Baal and apply it to Yahweh instead as a polemic against the Canaanite mythology. On page 875, there's an article on Athtar, the one who tried to ascend to the throne of Baal after Baal was killed and was cast down to earth. That provides the background for two of the taunts that the prophets used against the king of Babylon and against the king of Tyre, respectively. There's also a lot of images throughout. Here's a picture on page 1197. Here is what the denarius that Jesus asked for when he was asked, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? He says, show me a denarius. They showed him. Well, here's one. There you can see there's Caesar and it says right beside it, Augustus. So I want to emphasize the content, the study Bible content in the Chronological Study Bible is phenomenal. A++ in terms of background, context, bringing the world of scripture alive. So I cannot speak highly enough about those aspects of this study Bible. Now let's talk about the weakness. First thing you need to know, and this may not be a deal breaker for some of you, it may be for others. There are no theological notes. There are no life application notes, and there aren't any notes that follow the text. In other words, the only notes that you get are those transition headings, those half-page essays, and the little cultural insights that aren't tied to specific verses. So if you go to look up a specific verse, you probably won't find any study note that deals with that verse in particular. All of the study note content is background oriented, not verse by verse oriented. So that's something you need to know if you're looking to buy a study Bible. There's not really going to be any theological biases. I mean, in Romans 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, where you'd have all of these study notes in most study Bibles, there were hardly any study notes in this one. 
because that's a theological section. And it had already given you the background you needed to read the passage. So they didn't really feel a need to comment on any of the theological questions that those sections raise. Second thing that you need to know, the books have all been chopped up, moved around, rearranged, and put into a possible, but definitely not a certain, chronological order. This can be misleading for somebody who doesn't know biblical chronology very well, and they can just assume that this is the correct order when many of the books and passages can't be placed chronologically with any degree of certainty. It also makes it hard to find passages. This is why the index at the back, the scripture index, is so important, because it does lay out all of the sections of scripture in their canonical order, and then it gives you the page number in the next column in the Chronological Study Bible where you can find that passage. So if you take this as your Bible that you carry to church, small group, Sunday school, whatever, you're going to be doing a lot of flipping around in that index to try to locate the particular passage that the pastor or the teacher or the small group is reading or studying. And it makes it for confusing reading as well. Here's an example. On page 776 and 777, as you're reading along in the text, it jumps from 2 Kings 24 to 25, to Jeremiah 52, then to Jeremiah 10, then to Jeremiah 21. I mean, it's all over the place. Then on page 872, 873, you're reading along. 2 Kings 25, Jeremiah 52, then there's a transition, then you're in Isaiah 13. And this is especially evident when you come to the Gospels. On page 1120, 1121, you're in Luke 6, then you jump to Matthew 12, then Mark 3, then back to Luke 6. So when it comes to reading, yeah, you're getting a chronological ordering of events, but in some ways, I think it's more confusing laid out this way because everything is so chopped up. I'm going to put my cards on the table. I don't like the idea of a chronological Bible. I don't like the idea of cutting up the biblical books and rearranging them into some chronological schema. I, they weren't inspired to be read that way. They weren't written to be read that way. When you cut the books up, you miss a lot of the literary themes of the books themselves. Yeah, you're getting maybe an accurate chronology, but that's not what scripture is. It's not a timeline. So I just have an aversion to the concept of a chronological study Bible to begin with. And I want to make that clear because that's not specific to the Thomas Nelson chronological study Bible. That's across the board. I don't like chronologically rearranged Bibles. That's not what scripture was given to us as. That being said, it can be helpful to read through scripture in a somewhat chronological order. And for that reason, I would prefer that the canonical order is kept, but that there be an index in the back that says, here is the chronological order, if you would like to read it that way. I think that would be a better way to go than cutting the books up and repositioning them and creating this hybrid, massively disjointed, literarily nonsensical work, just so you can say, well, this is the order of the events, maybe. So that sounds like a really harsh review, but I want to make clear for a chronological Bible, which I don't like, this is about as good as you can get. The content is phenomenal. This is a great handbook, and that's how I would suggest using it. I would not make this your primary study Bible. I would not take this to church, to small group, to Sunday school. I don't think it would be useful that way. I think the most useful way to use this is to have on your shelf, and as you are studying through in whatever study Bible you prefer, and you have a question about the chronology, how do these events fit with these events, or just some background questions, hey, what was going on in this passage? then pull this out, find your passage in the scripture index, and look around at the background material and the contextual material and the chronological material, and that'll give you a better understanding of what you're reading in your study Bible. So that's how I would recommend using this. Is it a must-have? No, it's not a must-have. Is it good? It really is good. If you have to have a chronological Bible, then this would be the one I would choose. 
So those are my honest thoughts. I hope this is helpful if you're deciding whether or not to pick up this or any of our other study Bibles. If you have a question about any study Bible, do a search here on the channel first because we've covered about 50 or so different study Bibles on the market. If there's one that we haven't covered that you have questions about, shoot me a message via the Disciple Dojo contact page on our website, and I'll be happy to take a look at any study Bible you send me to review. But that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo.